things thrown on. Are you still rolling, refs? Mm -hmm. You know, I I get asked questions about this or that. There are no short answers. You know, I can give you a quick, cute, conceptual answer about something. But if you want to talk about fire, then we must talk. And if you want to know about fire, there's lots to know. If you want to know about water, there is so much to know. So there are no short answers. And we can, you know, we, we live in a world where it's, it's become so fanciful to just drop these cute, wow, one-liners at each other and think then that we know things and ask questions and not really want the answer, not really want to know, just want a quick fix conceptual solution to a curiosity that doesn't really matter anyway because it's a passing fancy. We don't live in a world where we have conversations about things that really matter anymore. I mean, endless explorations of the truth of things outside of ourselves. So no, there are no short answers, not if you really want to know. It is for us now to come to the truth of that which will assist humanity on the path of evolution, to know the nature of power that governs our world and our path of slow learning, what terrible things we do in the name of greed and power. What is it that will bring us to choose our way and our wisdom? How much more darkness before we see the light of life? And these children of the first people, what do they hold and trust for? One by one, we sever the last threads of hope and memory. Soon, there will be nothing left. I, I seem to keep discovering more about Paul. He's, he's, he's a very um, complex person. The more I chat to him and the more I interact with him, the more or less really I understand about the man. Um, so I knew that uh, after some brief talking that he was involved um, with the Bushmen over a period of time and that he had spent some time with them in the bush um, and that he has his own retreat uh, locally where he goes. He's very, very deeply rooted in the spirituality that he encountered with the Bushmen, with his time with the Bushmen, and it's become part of his paradigm. And that's to be respected, okay? There are very few people on this planet that have that depth of spirituality. He's just a typical filmmaker. His hair is long, not very kept. Uh, he's got a beard. He drives this really old car, you know, and he, he's, he's content with himself. I mean, I think he spends, he looks like he spends a lot of time by himself, but I think he's thinking or, or he's operating on other planes. about this incidental reality or incidental way of life rather than a fundamental existence? Um, one sees the relationship with the world which was utterly fundamental. Those One sees the relationship um, with life that was that was um, expressed out of a fundamental relationships. The the needs of humanity were food, shelter, and companionship, and those remain the essential needs of modern humanity. But we have also become so utterly cluttered with with incidentals. We have a thousand alternatives for every fundamental, and we spend much of our lives preoccupied within those alternatives and our lives therefore tend to be far more incidentally bound than fundamentally related. In this we express our separation
from the natural world, from the fundamentals, from the cosmos. I can say that going from this world to that world was much easier. I was going from an incidental place to a, to a fundamental place, so everything that I was preoccupied with there had meaning and mattered and was significant in terms of my surviving, in terms of my sustainability. Um, and then I think back again of going there, I missed nothing, nothing ever. And when I came back to this, I missed everything. I missed the truthfulness of my own relationship with the world, with the cosmos. I missed the stars, I missed the wind, the sun, the earth. I missed true voice, many things. That, um, that the, the fundamentals of the world hold infinitely more value than do the incidentals. And air is, if anything, it is the space between. And if you think of the space between, the nature of it, you know that nothing becomes but from the space between. It is not I, it is not you, it is what becomes from the space between us, what is more than you and me. And whether that is a physical or a spiritual relationship, it is out of that relationship that more becomes. So air is the space between, and that is an enormous thought if you consider that nothing becomes more but in relationship from the space between. warmed blood, I know how it was in that dawning of time when we early humans first made fire. It was in that moment of recreation of the sun that we became co-creator. In that moment was born our first glimmering awareness of the forces of creation and life. The sun had always been the giver of life, and now we humans could make the sun. We too could give light and life. In that first making of fire, we gave birth and breath to the primal idea of the creator and the self. You know, we consider ourselves to be communicative beings, but in a sense, we have all these conversations with so many people that we've actually possibly forgotten how to converse properly. Yeah, in a, in a sense we have, you know, if one talks about conversations, I, you know, if one looks at the ancient peoples, and this is something I, I um, spent so much time doing, one has horizontal conversations, because you live within the same context. So you don't have to finish your story right now, you can pick it up in a half an hour, you can pick it up tomorrow. So the conversation tends to continue and people listen and there are pauses between, there are spaces that are filled with thinking and with understanding. Whereas in modern conversation, very often people speak to top one another, and I get my sentence finished and you've got your information going, and then the next one's got his bit, and then suddenly it almost becomes this competition, and no one's quite listening because you, you're thinking of what to say instead of listening. And so the, the meaning of the thing, the truth of the thing, doesn't continue to flow, and, and the context changes with every contribution. 
um, and it's a different conversation. It doesn't it doesn't allow one to hear. It doesn't allow one to speak. It doesn't give the space for the words to settle in the listener. And it often is just a, 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 a stacking of opinions one against the other, with words rolling off tongues as easily as possible with as little meaning as necessary. So I, I have a lot of respect for old conversation where people speak and think while they speak and pause to think and attach the meaning that matters and listen. It's a kind of a communication that comes out of an unbelievable ability to observe. And that's one of the things that we don't have in communication today, is that we just, we walk in full of our own ideas, our own issues, but we're not really reading the landscape in front of us. So maybe that's something for us for communication today. Maybe we got to, we got to ask ourselves, what do we, what have we got to see? How do we open our eyes? In a lot of conversation, one's speaking must be shaped. The words that come out of your mouth must be shaped by the quality of the listener. So when you're listening to me, I'm, I'm compelled to speak more sense. I'm compelled to speak more truth because you're listening. And in a lot of modern conversation, people don't listen, so nobody cares what they say, because no one's listening. And you have a sense of it. Um, so for me, the quality of listening determines the quality of speaking. Fifteen years, six months old, the animal, and this dung dropped here onto the earth, 80, about 85 hours ago, which means three nights ago, um, at about um, four o'clock in the morning. Bull rhino, 15 years, 6 months old. So the animal was therefore born round about in March, 15 years ago. You know, it, it sounds, it may sound odd that um, one can read from the dung, the age of the animal, the sex of the animal, the hour, the minute that this dung dropped from the creature and fell to the earth. But this is just a, it's a practice of presentiment. It's a, it's a, it's a, the Bushmen do this readily. They feel in their bodies it's a tapping. It's like a heartbeat on the skin somewhere, under the skin. You have this, this feeling. It's like a heartbeat. It extracts the information out of the substance itself. It's not that one has to know or one knows. You simply ask of the earth. You ask of the, of the dung. Everything holds its own frozen wisdom. The principle is that simply because you can't see something, it doesn't mean that it's not true. And uh, we modern humans have just forgotten how to speak this language. We don't ask, we don't know how to ask the questions in the right way. We don't know how to take the information out of our bodies to our minds. That's the degree of our severance from ourselves, the degree of our severance from the workings of life itself. Water, it's such a thing, if one realizes to what extent that we humans have lost the relationship with this, this fluid body of the world, this 
these rivers, these seas, that in which the world's memory is held. And our disconnect from water is people drink water from taps is a conceptual thing. They just drink mindlessly the stuff that comes out of a tap that is, whether it's polluted or not, is fairly irrelevant these days. Because I learned about water. I learned about water in a place where there was none. I lived in this desert, Kalahari, seven years. For three years, we saw water for six days. We thirsted, we thirsted in our bones, we thirsted in our blood, we thirsted in our souls. We crawled into little bundles in dark shade and changed our metabolic state so that we could survive, so we could breathe shallow breaths and not burn our lungs. Just this longing for water and to, this, to the extent that um, you get that you long so much that you stop longing. You go, you go beyond thirst and you understand that there is no such thing as thirst. You just have water or you have none and in between that there is no longing, there is nothing. You have or you do not have. Thirst as a concept disappears. You follow anything to its end and you come to its opposite. So in this place of absolute dryness, I come to understand what water is. If one speaks of knowledge, the transfer of knowledge of the archetypal communities where the, the child inherited via blood the memory of the parent and knowledge was transferred in that way. It was a spiritual organic process. That is no longer the privilege of modern humanity. Modern humanity does not learn by being gifted by anything. We, our path is different. We are constituted to ask questions. We are constituted differently to the archetypal humans. And so for us, knowing is something that is achieved through effort out of free will. The task of the modern human being is to clearly and definitively seek and find knowledge, and not cheap conceptual information, but the knowledge of things itself. One is talking perceptual knowledge rather than conceptual. Not quick ideas, not weak, quick weekend fixes, but the actual knowledge of things. No free gifts, no quick fixes. Hard yards, every human soul taking every single step themselves. That's a thought. You might use that. Yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking we should have formed a lot more of your thoughts because you have a lot of thoughts. It could have been like anecdotes. There is so much to say about the element Earth. We live upon it as physical beings. But um, what comes to mind here is the extent to which human beings have become disconnected from the Earth, and of course all the elements. But when one thinks of the Earth, one thinks of that out of which everything has been compelled or impelled to become, to rise, to come to life. So I think when one thinks of the earth, earth one must consciously um, endeavor to re-establish that relationship with what is physical. If you think of the thread that runs through all of nature, and you see how in modern humanity that thread has become so rarefied and threatened, and you know that you must take this thread and you must weave it into the physical tapestry of your life. How old 
follow you, Paul. None of your business, Rafi. Can I ask? Huh? Can I ask? No, you you're trying you to pick it. Mainly because I refuse, I, what I always say is I, I'd rather know your know your, your qualities before I know your quantities. Mm -hmm. For many, many years, I haven't ever asked anyone their age, their star sign, and I, I, I just, I just try not to live in that world of quantification. I once had a, a girlfriend I lived with for four years. I never knew her age. Didn't have a clue within five years, and it was so liberating. And I find it quite interesting. So my st my stock answer is none of your fucking business. <laughs>We modern humans seem to learn backward, going from the part towards the whole. We isolate each component, separating all the bits of information in the hope of one day accumulating enough bits to add up to an understanding of the whole percept. Seldom do we reach that point of understanding. In modern language we process everything through our intellect, using words for which we have no feeling. Words that come from now obscure roots and from other beginnings with which we have no conscious connection. We have scant relationship with the origin of our sounds and subsequently with the meaning of many of our words. More and more I see the value of, of, of human conversation. And more and more I see the value of what arises between us when we speak in truth with what we have and what we seek. All of us. And when I see this human conversation that must and should arise again, it is something that has almost not become common. It, is, it happens in the odd specific exchange, but there is something more that is asked here, and that is that human beings begin to converse for ourselves and with ourselves so that we can once again find what was old community in future form and 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 develop future community of human beings and that is only out of a conversation about that which we know and that which we wish to know does that make sense ref it makes sense hey This was the best interview, eh? Huh? No. Yeah. I thought it was the worst. Seriously? Yeah. Well, maybe it's just we <laughs> understanding everything and everything's coming together. <coughs> because we've got a whole picture in our minds now of what, what's going to be. It's cool. The, our beginning shot is you by the fire. And you go, you go, Raps, are you rolling? Then you go straight into... Um, talking about how we can't have short conversations with you. We have to have long conversations, so that's going to be the first thing. So people know oh, in the beginning that it's... Oh, lovely.